Welcome to Butterflies of Wisdom, everyone, or maybe it should be called Caterpillars of Wisdom, because if you guys will bear with Stephanie and I, Stephanie will get rain on her, and I swear, and I will probably get a Caterpillar tractor outside my house, because they're going to be working on my life. So bear with us as we do the challenges of life during this interview. And so the reason why I brought Stephanie on is because she is a military wife. And as you guys know from listening to my podcast interview, in my in my bio it says when helps military veterans. And how I met Stephanie is through a volunteer site called Dedivati, and what Dedivati does is these mentees sign up to be mentored by me or other people in their film, and the reason why Stephanie picked me, lucky duck me, is because I am considered a book expert, as you guys well know by now, and I am helping Stephanie try to write a book on the use of service animals and mental health. So without further ado, I'm going to let Miss Stephanie take it away. Oh, thank you, Wen. Um, yeah, so my book is about uh, service animals and emotional support animals in mental health treatment. Uh, I'm actually going to school to become a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas. Um, and so that's where a lot of uh, my background has come from, is working with people who have um, psychiatric disabilities um, and helping them uh, work with their symptoms uh, with the use of a service or emotional support animal. Okay. So I hate to play devil's advocate here, Steph, but I will. A lot of news lately has come up about service animals and airplanes, believe it or not, and them getting, the animals getting fake service dog badges. And so what is your feeling on that now that you're becoming a trained professional in that and now using the power of a service dog? Yeah, so there there's a lot of misinformation out there about service dogs and emotional support animals. Um, under the ADA is for public access, the Americans with Disability Act, for housing, uh, for airplanes is actually under the Air Carriers Access Act. And the different laws have actual different requirements that they have for these animals, uh, which adds to the confusion between them. And so on airplanes, um, the requirements are basically just for the animal to have some type of um, benefit for the handler. Um, and they do kind of distinguish a bit between um, different types of service animals um, and even putting in a different group psychiatric service animals and then also with emotional support animals. And so there are these badges or registries um, or certifications. And under the ADA, they hold no legal standing and – all they really do is basically just kind of give someone a ID that just kind of gives their name and their dog's name. Um, and so with the ADA, they are not required at all. But under the Air Care Access Act, that's actually one of the things that someone can show to prove that their animal is an actual service or an emotional support animal. But the other issue so, with these IDs – oh, go ahead. So they would have to show paperwork. Kind of. With the IDs, 
to get those IDs, you just have to pay them some money and answer some questions. There's no real um, vetting process to actually get one of those. It's really easy. Um, but most people who have a psychiatric service dog, they will submit their doctor's note or their therapist's note that actually says that they are under the care of a mental health professional and are diagnosed with a disability. Um, okay. So there are some differences between an actual letter and these so-called registries. And I would do the same thing because I have a physical disability. I would cement um, paperwork, too, if I choose to go um, the service dog route, which eventually, you guys, I'm thinking about as I get older. And so I would submit paperwork and then underneath the registry saying I have a physical disability, cerebral palsy, this is why I need the service dog, because quite frankly, every time a different parent signing up to get their emotional support animal, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And so I get on my tangents, but um, it's not a good thing because it doesn't help when you're trying to deal with PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and you need a service dog. I mean, I look into getting a service dog myself, and all the war veterans were taking the service dog. I looked at um, Great Danes, actually. Great Danes was when it was, and all they wrote me back and said, when we're sorry, but we can't serve you because all the war veterans are now on the waiting list for your um, a potential service dog for you, and we put those guys before you. Yeah, there's definitely a big influx of need for these animals. Um, and there are a lot of different um, programs. Uh, so there's two ways you can get a service animal. You can own or train them, or you can get them from a program. And a lot of the programs are very niche specific, so they will only service maybe one or two um, different uh, diagnoses, and that's kind of what they will special on. So it can be hard to find an actual program that will um, help you with what you specifically need. Uh, really? I did not know that. I did not know that I was writing a service dog program thinking they specialize in cerebral palsy or in your case, PTSD, but I did not realize that these service dog programs have to be um, specialized in two different programs. I thought, well, cerebral palsy is cerebral palsy. Here the dummy I am thinks, oh, we can get a service dog in two seconds flat. No. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think one of the distinguishments I would like to make for the, the listeners is that there is a difference yeah. between service dogs and emotional support animals. So while both of them are for people with disabilities, emotional support animals or any type of animal that provides some type of comfort or emotional support with someone with a psychiatric disability. And then service dogs, on the other hand, are either a – dog or a miniature horse, uh, those are the only two allowed under the ADA, um, that are task trained to help mitigate a disability. Um, and so the reason that service dogs are allowed public access and emotional support animals are not is because of the extra training that they are um, given to help their handler uh, go about their daily lives. And so, okay. this, yeah, so why programs will speci specialize is because different disabilities will need different tasks or work that the animal is trained to perform. Now, why are you writing the book? Why are you so fascinated on the subject that you want to do 
book outside your cost book? Um, I've noticed that a lot of people um, in my program and mental health professionals in general have almost no idea about these animals and the purpose that they can have within um, a person's practice. And so since I actually have generalized anxiety and I have a service dog myself, um, there was so much misinformation and people not being able to get the help that they needed because these therapists were uninformed and didn't want to write these letters for people because they didn't want to get in trouble with the law themselves or they just had no idea about the topic. And so the reason that I really wanted to write this book was to help spread awareness to other mental health professionals about how these animals can actually help people in their treatment plans and get them to be having um, a better daily functioning level um, than they would have if if they were on meds. They may have horrible side effects or um, I would they may have – yeah, I would like there's to say that the opioid epidemic. A service dog is much better than a cow. Let's face it. Yeah, and I mean they, they aren't a better than a pill. Yeah, they are a treatment um, replacement, um, but they are a good part of a treatment plan. And some disorders are treatment resistant. There's um, some that they could be in, have lots of different meds and been in therapy for years and not get any better. Um, and so this is just another intervention that professionals can use to help their clients. Now, it's wonderful that you're now helping the field the best you can. Now, how is your book? If you don't mind me asking, I know we've texted back and forth. Yes, definitely text back and forth because I'm a mentor on this book, so I'm a little bit more heavily involved in this book, you guys, than you guys may think. But how is your book coming? I know you're juggling a book and juggling school. Um, it is. It's. Almost done. I'm hoping to have it done by February, at least the first draft, and then start getting into edits and all of that other fun stuff that comes along with writing a book. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to have it published uh, when I graduate in August. When you graduate in August, that's the plan, you guys. That's the plan. And I know my some of my listeners have disabilities, and some of my listeners are just um, solo entrepreneurs. But let's support Stephanie and the work she's going through. I heavily agree with Stephanie on the service dog industry and breaking myths about service dogs and what they're meant to be used for. They're not – they're meant to be used for – in conjunction with opioids, they're not meant to be used for completely taking epileptic seizures away from a person, and they're not completely used for support animals, or maybe they are, but they're used in conjunction with opioids, although we're trying to get these people off opioids to the best of our ability, but sometimes the opioid health and the service dog helps too. Yes, definitely. They're definitely a yeah, good definitely. treatment plan for a lot of disabilities, and they're just very underused and misused as well. Yep, misused big time. So, Stephanie, what has been your biggest success in writing this book and debunking the myth? Um, I think for me, just starting the book has been kind of like my biggest accomplishment because a lot of people say that they're going to go do something and they never actually get around to doing it. 
Um, but then also kind of on the education side, I had a classmate today was talking to me about a client that she had that she was thinking about a service dog and emotional support animal with. So I was able to be kind of a consultant for her um, so that she could give her client the correct information. So that made me feel really good and that I had an impact. That is dead cool. And, Stephanie, let me tell you, once you graduate and once you say, I have a book, that will give you more credit than it's worth because you can hand people your business card, a.k.a. your book, and say, here, read this book I have written. Plus, I have all the research behind me because I've been going to classes. Yeah, because a lot of people, they, they, there's a lot of people that graduate from our program, and so it's hard to sometimes um, set yourself apart from uh, yeah. the other people in your field. And so this is yeah. my way of kind of specializing and finding my niche. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And writing a book is a great start. And could you please explain to my listeners, because I've explained it once, but once is not enough, what, Zedirani is and how people can find Zedirani. I don't even know how I stumbled into classes. I probably stumbled into classes on a podcast and they said you can sign up to be a mentor, which I did, but I didn't realize that a lot of people in the veterans world, even veteran military spouses, want to write books too. Yeah, I actually found out about Veterati through a podcast as well. Uh, so Veterati is a social platform that connects uh, people in the community who may or may not be veterans themselves with um, military and actually spouses as well in my case. And the idea is that the mentees are able to choose mentors that are specific to what they want help in. And they can choose as many mentors that they want, and they can have um, any type of relationship. So, like, you and I, we, you know, we talk on a regular basis, and I've had other mentors where I kind of just ask some questions as they, as they come up and have more of a kind of distance relationship. Um, so it is what you make of it. Um, and I know the web address is just veterati.com, and you sign in through uh, your LinkedIn account, so it will actually transfer over a lot of your information, um, yeah. which makes it really easy to set up. Yeah, and the reason why we talk so much on a daily basis is because I think this subject is fascinating, the emotional support animal subject. Also, writing a book is an intimate thing. So that's why I talk to Stephanie on a daily basis, just to be her accountability, her accountability buddy, because you got to remember, you guys, I am, um, this will be my night, my 10th book coming out. This is Stephanie's first book. And it's really scary when you write your first book. And Stephanie will probably agree with me. It's really scary when you put the first words down on paper. And it's still really scary publishing your 10th book. Yeah. I know when I first started, I was kind of like, I got all the easy chapters done, and now I'm kind of in the harder chapters and now I'm like, oh, am I actually, like, know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. So you, like Stephanie did, she used the resources that she had to reach out to me. And I'm very available to you guys. I'm also a mentee on Benavati. And so um, that's one way to get a hold of me, Twitter is another way, and Steph has my contact information. If you guys want to go through her, she can 
that means three seconds flat. And so, Stephanie, where can people get your book, essentially, and um, where can people find you? Yeah, so I have a website. Um, it's Steph L. Taylor, S-T-E-P-H-L-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Um, and that is kind of my um, landing page for everything. Um, so there's a tab on there that has my book information, and uh, people can send me a message um, or sign up for my mailing list to uh, receive updates and possibly be a advanced reader for the book before it's even published. Um, so there are some other perks as well on my page. And how are you planning on publishing the book through Amazon or through? I know we I know we talked about a crowd funded publishing deal through um, something other than self publishing which is run by Wes Marson and if you guys go back you can hear Wes's episode on my podcast actually and so I know we talked about that and I know you put it in your newsletter but in my personal opinion I would post it I would publish it in August on Amazon yeah, I'm definitely, I definitely want to do a print book and an ebook. Um, depending on how my mailing list goes, that's what I'm kind of focusing on right now. Um, I may go through kind of that hybrid publisher, um, or I may just self-publish on Amazon. Um, I haven't fully decided what I'm going to be doing on that one yet. Well, we can, we can always talk about this. And if you guys have any suggestions for Steph to help her along the way, please let her know and please let me know so I can pass them along to Steph. And Steph, this has been a wonderful conversation. Now, I know you have two questions for me, which I thought about all morning. So go ahead and ask me those questions. Okay, uh, my first one was, um, I was wondering about where the butterfly theme originated. I noticed it in a couple of your, um, in a couple of your books and things, and so I was kind of wearing, wondering where that originated from. Okay. My, no one knows this white front place, but my family owned Caterpillar Practice, and I thought about this when my mom died, actually. The podcast spun off my original book, and I thought about why not using the my heritage and Caterpillar Praxis and expand it even more in Two Butterflies of Wisdom, because you guys don't know that I mentioned um, – I don't even mention butterflies and wisdom in the original book. I mentioned that the book was written before I even dreamed of having a podcast, but I mentioned my family owned franchises of caterpillar classes in Canada and the Bahamas. But I took that meaning off of the caterpillar tractor and expanded it into butterflies of wisdom because I thought the caterpillar is a beautiful thing and it turns into a strong, beautiful butterfly. So that's why the origin um, came off of butterflies of wisdom. But, yes, the book spun into this podcast. Okay. Uh, and then my second question was, um, what has been your favorite experience writing your books? Oh, my favorite experience. My favorite experience is just sharing my story and meeting people like you and helping other authors become authors and expand their stories. So being able to help others and 
uh, with your own yes. personal experience. Yes, with my own personal experience and um, being able to help others. And I love the writing process. I do not love the editing the process. The editing process, oh, my God, that, that's my nemesis. That's my nemesis. I'm actually working on a book um, on scoliosis right now, you guys. And I, I'm i just going to hand that over to hand the messy manuscript over to a publisher. I said to my publisher, I'm done. I need you guys' help. They're going to pull in a liner that is plastic copy editor. And so I don't have to do the editing on that book. But the editing is not my favorite part. And I don't think it's most people's favorite part either. Yeah, it's definitely not my favorite part. I'm kind of dreading that part coming up. Yeah. But I want you guys to go sign up for Steph's mailing list and go support this book and put it to Amazon number one. And then we'll see what happens with this book. And I'm very, very honored that Steph did one podcast interview with me and actually got to talk about a little bit about the work, more about the book, and we'll see what happens with this book. And I'm very honored to be helping a military wife with this book because I think it's one of those subjects that needs to be out there in the world. And so that's what I do why I do what I do, and I appreciate Jeff's time. I'm sure that Wayne didn't get involved. A caterpillar tractor didn't get get involved. The only thing that did get involved was my phone ringing, which I apologize profusely for that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode about emotional service animals and why Jeff is writing books. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This podcast has been launched by Grace by Grit. Grace by Grit is a clothing line out of California, and they're giving you 20% off when you type in the code EXO Butterflies, along with Jeff's information that will be found in the show notes. And yes, you guys will hear this episode probably small. And so I look forward to your feedback on this episode. And then I have a couple other announcements coming up in my own writing journey, which I will share with you. And then I've thought about something which I'm going to share with you next week about my own writing journey and seeing if you guys want to help me with something, which I'm sure you do. And so I just hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I hope you guys enjoyed another fabulous episode with Stephanie and I. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me. Bye.